Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Japanese American National Museum. I'm Anne Burrows, and I'm the CEO, the President and CEO of JANUM. On, and on behalf of our trustees, our governors, our volunteers, and our staff, I'd like to thank you all for attending the public opening of our exhibition Under a Mushroom Cloud, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and the Atomic Bomb. It's truly a profoundly moving exhibition that marks next year's 75th anniversary of the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, events that inexorably changed the history of the world and events that, that continue to affect us deeply. I'd like to extend a very special welcome to the director of the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum, Mr. Takuo Takekawa. Without, without your support and the support of your team, we would not have been able to bring the exhibition to Janum. It's been a real honor to have had this partnership with you. And all of you will be hearing a little bit more from Director Takikawa later in, in, in the program. We also have with us members of the American Society of Hiroshima and Nagasaki at, at Atomic Bomb Survivors, who were also instrumental in helping us develop this exhibition and the accompanying public programs. And also later on in the program, you'll be hearing from um, one or two of them. So, in the course of developing this exhibition, we've worked very closely with the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki to bring this deeply moving exhibition to Janum. But here, we believe it's also extraordinarily important to include the Japanese experience in this partnership and in the telling of the story as well. And what many people don't know is that there were approximately 3,200 Americans of Japanese ancestry in Hiroshima at the time of the bombing. And we wanted to make sure to add their experiences to our presentation of the exhibition and also in our public programs that we will hold over the, over the coming months. It's impossible to even begin to imagine or even to put into words the pain and suffering as a result of the horror of these bombings. But it's our hope that with this exhibition, in a very small way, we'll be able to address some of the deep physical and spiritual wounds that have resulted. And also, really importantly for us here at Janum, is to promote a better understanding between people here and in Japan. The powerful image of the mushroom cloud may be familiar to all of us, but we all need to learn more about what happened underneath that cloud and its lasting legacy for us to be able to move on and to learn those horrific lessons and to ensure that it, it's never repeated. So finally, um, I would like to invite Clement Hanami, who is our Vice President of Exhibitions. I'd like to invite him to come up to the podium to say a few words, to introduce our program for this afternoon, um, intr introduce our speakers and to take it from here. So Clement, it's over to you. Thank you so much. Good, um, good afternoon. Is my chair so hard to adjust here? Hi, like Anne said, my name is Clement Tanami, and I'm the uh, Vice President of Exhibitions at the Japanese American National Museum. I've actually been here for 28 years now. Hard to believe. Some of you probably aren't even, weren't, weren't even born yet, so. Um, but, and during that time we have done so many exhibitions, and um, I don't know if there's any one particular exhibition that has had more meaning than this exhibition that we have today, Under a Mushroom Cloud. Um, from a personal experience, my father was a volunteer evacuee. He was living in Long Beach, close to Terminal Island, during, um, right after Pearl Harbor, and so their family, was able to voluntarily evacuate to Idaho. And my mother, she was actually in Hiroshima during World War II, so she was actually a survivor, uh, Hibakusha, very close to the Hypo Center. Um, so it, it brings much passion to these types of projects here at the Japanese American National Museum. Um, interesting fact about 
my knowledge of the atomic bomb is that um, as a young child, I used to be with my mother all the time, and um, she would have these scars on her leg that looked like a daikon when you cut it in half, and she would always explain them as childhood injuries. And so, wouldn't think much of it until when I was at school at UCLA much later, I would see these pictures in books and I would think, God, those look just like my mother's scars. And so when I discovered that those were, she was actually a survivor, we finally started to have these deep conversations about her experiences, but there was always that thought in the back of my head, like, why hadn't she told me these things before? And it's clear when you look at this exhibition that it's a, it's an, you know, it's a very unimaginable event that why would anybody want to share? And so that's why I think it's so important that our survivors who are here today share these stories because it is only through sharing these stories that this, this story will, con that people will realize atomic bombs are not the answer. Um, they're actually the opposite of the answer. Um, it's, it's a, they're just terrible. So um, congratulations to the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum for their continued efforts. The ASA, the survivors, for their continued efforts. Um, we, are, we at the museum are just grateful that UL will allow us to host your story here. So with that, I'm going to start the program by introducing Mr. Takigawa. Um, he's going to do a presentation of the, uh, from the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum. It was opened in 1955 and has been sharing the memories of the A-bomb since then. The museum recently completed renovations of the main building, and he will tell how the museum is trying to convey memories of the A-bomb experience to the next generation. Please welcome Takuo Takigawa. Hello,皆様,こんにちは。ただいまご紹介いただきました広島平和記念資料館の滝川でございます。本日は被爆体験の記憶の継承と題しまして当館の紙面歴史今年4月にリニューアルオープンしました新天地当館が現在直面している課題等についてご報告し少しでも平和の思いを共有していただきたいと思います。Thank you very much for your kind introduction. I'm Takuo Takigawa, director of the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum. The title of my talk today is Conveying Memories of the A-Bomb Experience. I will explain our museum's history and mission, our new exhibits opened this April, and the challenges the museum now faces, hoping to share our wishes of peace with you. 1945年8月6日午前8時15分、一発の原子爆弾が広島市の上空約600メートル 人類史上初めて都市とそこに暮らす人々を標的にこの恐るべき兵器が用いられた瞬間です。At 8:15 a.m. on August 6, 1945, a single atomic bomb detonated approximately 600 meters or 19 um, 1970 feet above central Hiroshima. That was the moment in human history when this terrifying weapon was first used against the city and its people. 原子爆弾から放たれた数千度の熱線は一瞬にして街を火の海と化し熱線を浴びた人々は黒焦げとなって死んでいきました即死を免れた人々も焼け焦げた自らの皮膚を体から、ぶら下げて逃げ惑いました
They desperately sought safety, their burnt skin dangling from their flesh. Massive doses of radiation penetrated deep into the bodies of survivors, causing pain and suffering even today. The Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum, established in 1955, 10 years after the atomic bombing, was one of the peace commemorative facilities designed in accordance with a special law stipulating that Hiroshima be rebuilt as a peace memorial city. Since opening, its overarching mission has been to convey accurately the memories of what happened beneath the mushroom cloud. Hiroshima Hiroshima彼はその後も協力者とともに焦土を歩いては瓦礫を拾い集め公民館の一室で展示を始めましたその終年は広島市の都市再生事業に引き継がれ当時新進気鋭の建築家三毛建造設計の平和記念記念公園の中心施設として
パノラマ写真などを見た後にすぐ本館に移る順路にしました。This is the current museum. The main building is in the center, with the east building on the right. But before the renovation, the route first took visitors through a large introductory exhibition, filling most of the east building. As a result, visitors with limited time would have to move quickly through the main building, which featured the authentic artifacts. Now the tour route has visitors moving to the main building after quickly viewing panoramic photos of the city before and after the A bombing. 来館者はまず東館3階の導入展示で被爆前の街並みや人々の表情を捉えた写真を目にします。In the introductory exhibit on the third floor of the East Building, visitors encounter large photographs showing what Hiroshima looked like and how people lived before the bombing. ここれらの映像を退避させることで穏やかな日常が一瞬にして奪われたことが印象づけられますその後来館者は渡り廊下を渡り本館に入ります In the next room, the walls are covered by a 360 degree panoramic photograph of the devastated city taken from the hypocenter after the bombing On the floor of that room is a newly installed white panorama. This exhibit presents a model of Hiroshima City, aerial photographs taken before and after the bombing, and a high vision video recreation of the A bomb explosion are projected on the model. The introductory exhibit uses the before and after contrast to help visitors comprehend how easily and instantaneously the city and the day to day lives of its people were obliterated by a single atomic bomb. Then, visitors walk to the main building through a connecting corridor. 今回、新たに朝鮮半島をはじめ、台湾や中国大陸からの人々など、外国人被爆者のコーナーも設置しました。彼らの中には、強制的に徴用された人もいました。中国や東南アジアからの留学生や、捕虜となったアメリカ軍兵士などの原爆の犠牲となりました。左側の写真は、ハワイで日系アメリカ人として生まれ、10歳の時に広島で被爆した新井さんが当日着ていたシャツです。We also created a new section regarding foreign A bomb victims, including those from Korea, Taiwan, and mainland China. Some had been conscripted or recruited from these areas. Students from China and Southeast Asia, and even US prisoners of war, fell victim to the bombing. The photo on the left shows the shirt worn by Mr. Arai on the day of the bombing. He was born in Hawaii to a Japanese American family and was exposed to the bomb in Hiroshima at, age, at the age of 10. その後、来館者は再び東館3階に戻ります。東館3階では、原爆の開発と投下の歴史、科学的な観点から見た放射,の放射線の影響、核兵器の開発競争などの国際情勢をパネルで解説しています。Then, visitors return to the third floor of the East Building. There, panels explain the history of the development and the dropping of the atomic bombs, a scientific look at the effects of radiation, and international conditions involving nuclear weapons, including the nuclear arms race. 東館2階では、広島市の、広島の軍都としての歴史、戦後復興や平和活動の歩みに関する展示があります。焦土からの復興の礎となった広島平和記念都市建設法の成立、被爆者援護の歴史などをも紹介しています。フロア中央には、より詳細な資料を読めるタッチパネル式のメディアテーブルを設置しています。Exhibits on the second floor convey the history of Hiroshima as a military city, the city's reconstruction after the war, and the path of Hiroshima's efforts to promote peace. Also introduced is the enactment of the Hiroshima City Construction Law, which laid the foundation for the city's recovery from the ruins and the history of relief measures for A bomb survivors. 
In the center of the space is a media table with touch screens so that visitors can freely access more detailed information. こちらは開館以後の入館者数の推移を示したグラフです。緑色が日本人入館者で、青色が外国人入館者です。昨年、2018年度の入館者数は150万人、そのうち43万人近くが海外からの来訪者でした。全館リニューアルした今年は、4月から9月までの半年間で、This is the graph of visitors since its opening. Japanese visitors are shown in green and foreign visitors are in blue. The number of visitors to the museum in the fiscal year 2018 reached 1.52 million, nearly 430,000 of which were from overseas. During just six months from April to September this year, 1.08 million people have already visited the museum. 続きまして、当館が行っている主な事業についてご紹介します。一つ目、修学旅行生等への被爆体験講話の実施。二つ目、原爆展平和学習用資料の貸し出し。三つ目、被爆証言ビデオの制作。Now let me introduce some of our major projects. One, sharing survivor testimony with students visiting Hiroshima. Two, Lending and providing materials for A bomb exhibitions and peace studies. Three, recording and utilizing video, videotapes of survivor testimonies. Fourth, 9月にニューヨーク州ロチェスター市で開催し、本日11月9日、ここ全米日系博物館で原爆展をオープンいたしました。Four, A bomb ex exhibitions in Japan and abroad. Five, A bomb testimonies to foreign countries by using the internet video conferencing system. In cooperation with the city of Nagasaki, we hold A bomb exhibitions abroad twice a year. This year, we had an exhibition in Rochester, New York in September, and then just today, we opened another A bomb exhibition here at the Japanese American National Museum. Tokan が直面する主な課題として、被爆者が高齢化する中、被爆体験のない若者への被爆の実装の継承、劣化する資料の保存と展示環境の改善、展示手法及び来館者サービスの向上などがあります。The challenges our museum now faces are communicating the reality of the bombing to those without experience of the war while the A bomb survivors are aging, preserving and repairing the aging materials and improving conditions for displaying them, and upgrading the effectiveness of the display and services for visitors. The most important thing is that if you are a person who is not a person who is not a person who is not a p e r s 今回のリニューアルにおいて、本館は被爆者の視点で、あの日を再現することを目指しました。被爆者がいなくなった後も、あの日、あの場所に存在した資料は、声なき声で事実を伝えることができます。一つ一つの資料に、犠牲者の苦しみ、遺族の悲しみ、さまざまな思いが託されていることを、見る人に感じていただければと思っています。The biggest challenge is how the museum will be able to continue talking about the city Hiroshima's wishes for peace when no A bomb survivors are left. In this renewal, our goal was for the main building to present scenes of August 6th as seen by A bomb survivors. A bomb artifacts, silent witnesses to what happened under the mushroom cloud, convey the reality of the atomic bombing. They play a crucial role, especially considering that the day must come when no A bomb survivors remain. We intend to utilize and display the artifacts in ways that help visitors perceive the profoundly personal pain and sorrow of victims and bereaved family members. These feelings are carried by each and every artifact. Today, this afternoon, we will be able to experience an experience of the survivors. They will be able to experience their experience. They will be able to experience what happened on that day. 
ご理解いただきたいと思います。生き残った被爆者たちの願いは、同じ苦しみを他の誰にもさせたくないということです。そのような被爆者の願いの実現のために、一層、広島市と長崎市は、核なき世界の実現に向けて努力してまいります。After my presentation, you will hear the testimony of two A bomb survivors living in the United States. We believe that listening to the survivors' personal experiences will help you understand the disaster of the atomic bombing more deeply. The cherished wish of the Hibakusha, who managed to survive, is for no one else to ever suffer as they did. To achieve their wish, the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki will continue to make ever greater efforts to achieve a world free from nuclear weapons. Sayori. 戦時中は収容所に隔離されるなど、日系人自身も困難な生活を送っていたにもかかわらず、カルフォルニアの広島県人会等が中心となり、被爆後の広島に援助の手を差し伸べていただきました。多大なご支援をいただいたことに、御礼申し上げ、私の挨拶とさせていただきます。Thank you very much. At the very end of my presentation, let me point out that despite the hardship Japanese immigrants faced during the war, including loss of property and confinement in incarceration camps, the Hiroshima Prefecture Association of California and many Japanese Americans offered generous aid to Hiroshima soon after the bombing. I would like to take this opportunity to, to express my profound gratitude for their generosity, their goodwill, and deep love. Thank you very much. With that, we're going to come to the last part of this program, and that is with our two survivors who are, are here today to talk about their experiences.、Um, we have today both Howard Kakita and Junji Saroshina, are members, who are members of the ASA, American Society Hiroshima Nagasaki Atomic Bomb Survivors, which Kazuya Sueshi, the woman that we just saw, Was the president until her death. Now Junji is president and he's taking over.、Um, ASA was instrumental in helping us to develop this exhibition.、Um, I remember them coming to the museum many times to talk with us. And、um, they also helped with、um, creating a lot of the public programs. So we, we really thank you for your assistance with that.、Um, they will be both giving、um, individual presentations. And then after the presentations, we'll have a short question and answer.、Um, and I think it's、uh, important to note that Junji and Howard were both assigned or bestowed to be anti nuclear weapon ambassadors by the Minister of Foreign Affairs. And they're not under, I guess this is the ambassadorship here. I can't read it because it's in Japanese. Okay, so I think at first we'd like to welcome up Howard Takita. My name is Harvard Kikita.、Uh, I'm a sensei. Both of my parents were Nisei Kibei. My father was born in Bakersfield, and my mother in Brody, California.、Uh, they both went back to Japan when they were extremely young. However, my,、uh, my father, at the young age of around 13, came back to the United States、uh, and went to high school here. And had a wonderful life、uh, in Los Angeles、uh, after graduating from high school. And my father may have embellished this story, but let me tell it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> When he got married, it was kind of interesting.、Uh, when he was 25,、uh, he got a letter from, and by the way, he had a girlfriend at that time. <laughs> and he got a letter from his father, my grandfather, saying, Hiroji, you are now married. Your wife is arriving in San Pedro Harbor. <laughs> Go pick her up. Now, can you imagine that?、Uh, he said the toughest part was trying to tell his girlfriend how it happened. <laughs> <laughs> Then、uh, 
At that time, my mother arrived uh, in San Pedro Harbor uh, as a Fisher Bride, along with many, many other uh, Fisher Brides at that time. Uh, and I asked my father, I said, what did you think? You know, when you looked up in the ship <laughs> and saw all these Fisher Brides and you saw your bride, what was your first impression? He said, <laughs> Meaning, it was, well, it's not very good. <laughs> so I turned around and asked my mother, I said, uh, what, what did you think uh, uh, about my father when you looked down and saw him waiting for you? She says, Gakarishita. <laughs> Meaning, she was greatly disappointed. <laughs> but I'm sure all that is, uh, you know, all in fun. But, Anyway, that's, uh, that's how they were married. That was uh, in 1935. I was born in 1938 uh, in East Los Angeles, just right down First Street, probably a couple miles in Boyle Heights. Uh, my journey, oh, actually, my brother was born a year and a half before me uh, in the same area. But my journey to Japan started just about that time. Let me go to the next slide right here and show you the cast of characters. <laughs> <laughs> now, this picture was taken in, in Yokogawa just about the time I was born. And they took this picture, a family portrait in Yokogawa, uh, which is in the middle of Hiroshima. And they sent this picture to my uh, father. Uh, this is my grandfather right here, my grandmother, uh, who ultimately saved us, raised us, and finally we had to depart. Uh, and then my mother's side, on the Nishikawa side, uh, this is my uh, grandfather, Nishikawa, this is my grandmother, my mother's mother. I won't get into all of that, uh, it's just uh, too many to uh, talk about. <laughs> My journey starts uh, in 1940, when I was about two years old. We got words that uh, my grandfather was greatly ill, gravely ill, and that he was not expected to survive. So my father uh, packed us all up, and uh, we left San Pedro Harbor bound for Yokohama, then ultimately into Hiroshima. Now the journey, there's a picture of us in, uh, this is a passport photo uh, on the left. I'm the youngest one there, the cute one. <laughs> <laughs> That's my older brother and myself on the boat. And then there's a picture of the family again on, on the ship. Uh, my mother, by the way, was eight months pregnant at that time. But when we got to Japan, uh, we stayed there for six months. During that period, we had a wonderful reunion. My grandfather's health actually improved. Uh, what happened was uh, he was basically suffering from depression because all of his boys, the older boys, were in the United States. Uh, and he had never seen his grandchildren. So he took the drinking probably a little bit too much. And his health will start to decline. Now, everything was fine until about six months later when uh, we ran out of money and my father said, well, we're gonna have to go back to the United States. And then he went back to his old habit of over excessive, excessive drinking and uh, his health started to decline. So my father in his infinite wisdom he decided that he will return to the States, sell his business, get rid of the house and we and come back to Japan to take care of the uh, grandfather. Now to show good faith that uh, he was going to return, uh, he left my older brother and myself in care of my grandfather. So for the duration of the war, well you know what happened, they came to the state uh, and the war started. They were interned in Poston, Arizona uh, for the duration. And here we were in Yokogawa, uh, living with uh, my grandparents. Anyway, this is an area photo of uh, Hiroshima. Uh, so you can see the hypercenter was since uh, ground zero. And we lived right there 
But at the end of the tip of the uh, arrow, black arrow, is the intersection of two major cities. Uh, that was 1.3 kilometers uh, from the center, which is eight tenths of a mile or about 4,000 feet. We were there when the bomb exploded. The Nola Gay, the airplane, came from the southeast in this direction, dropped the bomb, made a U-turn, and got the hell out of there. On the morning of August 6, 1945, um, as Swedish son said, it was a beautiful morning. Uh, we got ready to go to school, and as we were going towards school, there were a number of uh, students coming back in our direction, and they told us the school was canceled because there were still some enemy aircraft in the neighborhood. So uh, we came back happily, changed into our clothes, and uh, uh, just about that time, the air raid siren went on again, and we could see the vapor trail of a B-29 coming over and coming over in the distance. So Kenny and I, we climbed on top of the roof, and we're watching the vapor trail. When my grandmother came out of the kitchen, she was washing dishes there, and she she got extremely mad at us and told us to get off the roof immediately. So. Grudgingly, we came off the roof. My uh, brother will be walking towards the gate of the house, away from out of the courtyard. My grandmother went back to, into the kitchen to wash dishes. And I went underneath a uh, bathhouse. It was a separate structure uh, built adjacent to the house, uh, which housed the bath and some uh, fuel to burn underneath the bath. And then on top of the bathhouse was a flat platform where the, uh, my grandmother would dry her laundry. Okay. So I went underneath the uh, bathhouse and just as the bomb exploded. Now, if you were a little bit further away, maybe one, two, one or maybe two or three kilometers away, they would see a flash followed by a tremendous boom. For me, I didn't see anything. I didn't see the flash, didn't hear the boom. I was knocked out instantaneously. And when I came to, I, uh, things were beginning to burn around me and the whole building was on top of me. But fortunately, I was not seriously injured, just knocked out. So I dug myself out, and went into the courtyard and found my brother who had walked back from where he was. The only thing, injury he had was, was a small burn on the top of his uh, forehead. Now, my grandmother was not so lucky. She was in the kitchen, probably facing the window. And when the glass came, all the pieces of glass were embedded into her body. And she was bleeding profusely but no fatal injury. Uh, she was, when we found who she was, my grandfather and some of the men were trying to uh, take her up. And uh, after a few minutes, they were successfully able to extract her from the house. And she was okay, although bleeding uh, quite a bit. Excuse me, I gotta drink a little bit of water. So we were able to escape uh, uh, from that area. My uh, grandfather decided to stay in the area to try to put up the fire, but uh, was to no avail. He didn't realize the extent of damage across the city. Uh, he told my grandmother to take the boys and start going towards the mountain, which will be approximately north of where we were living, because it was not burning yet. So we. So my grandmother would take us by the hand, and we started walking towards the main road, uh, close to the river, and then we turned right and headed north uh, towards the, uh, the mountain. However, when we got to the, uh, the road, there were oh, dozens, maybe hundreds of people. The sea of 
people seriously wounded coming from the inner city, trying to escape the burning, burning area. Some of them with tremendous wounds. They had such bad burns that skins would be dripping from their body. Some had broken bones. Some had very serious injuries of open wounds, like guts hanging from the stomach. It was something that you, you can't forget. And if I could make this thing work, <laughs> and the next slide, this is part of the exhibit that's shown at the uh, museum that Takigawa mentioned. Okay. I was there, as I mentioned, about, about a month ago, and I took this picture. It's, not, it's a little bit fuzzy, but that's what it looked like. We saw a bunch of people trying to escape uh, in that shape. Quite a number of people uh, that were uh, injured. Uh, some of them were walking, but many of them were already on the road. Some dead, and some uh, just about ready to die. Uh, so, but we walked through the sea of carnage, and we were ex able to escape towards the mountain. Uh, I'm not sure that how long it took us. It could have been 30 minutes, it could have been an hour, it could have been a couple hours. But uh, the time just escaped him. But after a while, we were able to escape. And uh, we, we found a functional uh, train station where a train was being used to, uh, to move the refugees out of the city to the uh, <coughs> outpost. Now, when we escaped, uh, we went to an area called Kabe. Kabe is about 10 miles uh, north of uh, Hiroshima. And we had relatives living there, and they uh, provided us shelter until the end of the war. When the war ended, we went back to, the, uh, to Yokogawa. Now, when we went back to Yokogawa, that was another one of the devastating part of my life. Now, this is not the exact picture of our neighborhood, but it looks somewhat similar to this. Everything was flat. There was nothing standing. Uh, in this particular picture, you could see that there was a building here, but we had no building in our area because it was residential. And the body, bodies of uh, some of the people are still laying around. Not everybody was clean. And all, not all the bodies were cleaned out. Now, the thing that really bothered me was the smell of cremation. Every day, all day, and all night, people were being cremated. Uh, and the smell just filled the whole area. And it, even to this day, I could remember that smell. And sometimes it will turn my stomach. Now, I hate to uh, show this picture because it kind of always choked me up. Uh, it's a, it was a photo taken by a Marine Sergeant, Joe O'Donnell. And it's a picture of a boy, a young boy, with his sister strapped on his back, uh, a dead sister, standing at a cremation pit to have her sister cremated. Now, here's a picture of my uh, uh, grandfather, uh, my older brother Kenny, and myself. Uh, this is uh, maybe several weeks after we got back. Uh, we got dysentery, for, which lasted a number of weeks, maybe months. I'm not exactly sure the length of time. Uh, we had lost our hair. This uh, picture of the family, my grandmother is in there, and also my aunt Eiko, uh, who was not in the city during the bombing, uh, but who came home afterward. Then about the, this, I believe this is about uh, early 
in the winter time of 1946, mm -hmm. uh, we, this is the uh, grass portal being taken in front of the school that used to be. You can see the boys in the back row are quite a bit younger, I mean older than the boys in the front. This probably represents about three classes of uh, cho uh, children. This is a, this, these are the number of uh, children that survived. What's not shown is that how many, we don't know how many have passed away during that time. How many people do we lose during that period? Now, casualties. Now, I think in the last uh, couple of uh, uh, slides or videos, we know that within the first one hour, there's approximately 70,000 people had died. By the end of the month, by the end of the year, by the end of 1945, the number of deaths amounted to 140,000. And then by end of that decade, uh, by 1950, the total number of deaths is uh, in the neighborhood of 200,000. That's from one bomb, the most primitive bomb, a bomb that's probably existed in the world. Now, those are just numbers. Let me put some faces to them. Now, you saw an earlier picture that uh, my uh, maternal side, uh, my the Nishikawa family, my mother's uh, family, uh, they were farmers in an area called Furue, which is about uh, oh, three and a half kilometers from the Hypo Center, approximately Three, uh, three and a half kilometers, I guess. They were farmers, and they grew something called, I don't know, uh, some of you may recognize it, it's called satsuma imon. Mm. It's a very delicious uh, sweet potato. Uh, I really like that, but they grew quite a bit of, uh, uh, mostly that, and on the day of August 6th, uh, they, they took their produce and went into the city, the three of them, uh, to sell. And I'm not sure exactly the location uh, wh wh where they were uh, when the A-bomb went off, but I presume that it was something very close, probably within a half mile of the hypo center. Now, my grandmother, her body was never found. She just disappeared. My grandfather was seriously injured. Uh, he had a very serious head injury. Uh, and he said that uh, he searched for her for a number of hours, and even when the city was burning, but to no avail. But afterwards, he, was, he did manage to bring himself back to Purue, only to die a month later from head injury. My uncle, um, he was kind of lucky in a way that, in a way that, um, uh, he, although seriously burned on both legs from the radiation from the blast, uh, he was able to bring uh, get himself home. However, he was under uh, doctor's care for several years, trying to heal his wound. His leg burns were so bad that. Uh, uh, his, uh, I believe his, help, uh, his uh, growth was stunted. He never got to be any much bigger than five feet two inches tall. <coughs> now, I mentioned earlier that uh, my, my parents came back to the United States. And then I guess right after the war, like many of some of you, I know some of you in here were in, uh, in the camp, or your parents would have been in the camp. But so many of the Japanese Americans who were in that area, er, era uh, were sent to various uh, internment camps. And my parents were in Boston, Arizona. When the war ended, they got a newspaper which had an aerial photo of Hiroshima with the ring of destruction 
circle around that uh, portal. <coughs> and they realized that we were located in the first ring of total destruction. So they assumed that we were dead. However, they did initiate a search uh, through various organizations uh, to see if they could find us. Although it took a number of months, uh, it was through Red Cross, American Red Cross that they were able to find, locate us and uh, told them that we would still survive. Now, in between uh, that time, well, when my parents uh, were, uh, when the war ended, my parents were uh, uh, returned to Los Angeles uh, and they established a business. Uh, in uh, downtown Los Angeles, but um, they, it took them three years before they had sufficient funds uh, to, uh, saved to send for us. So in 1948, uh, they, they had gathered enough money to uh, send, uh, pay for the passage for us to return to the, uh, to the United States. However, uh, back in Japan, when Kenny and I were told that we have to leave Japan, leave our grandmother, who raised us, saved us, nurtured us, and return and go to the United States to two people that we, we have we don't remember. They left us when we were only two, when I was only two. So, so we raised the holy hell, saying that we're not going to go. <laughs> <laughs> we want to stay with grandma. Uh, However, uh, with lots of crying, yelling, screaming, uh, they did put us on a boat bound uh, from Yokohama bound for uh, United States. Now, when we got to the United States, uh, you know, they, there was a lot of hugging and kissing and so forth on their part. <laughs> However, Kenny and I was just standing there and said, who are these people? <laughs> Since, since we don't remember anything about them, it was a very awkward moment for us. <laughs> and then, um, uh, as far as the transition uh, into a new, completely new family was pretty difficult. It took a number of years before we got used to uh, the life uh, in, in the United States. Uh, most difficult part was my, uh, remember that brother that was born in Japan? Well, he went back to the United States with my parents, raised in the camp, and when we came back uh, from Japan and joined the family, um, he was kind of rebellious. He had all the attention up to that point. And then there's two, two guys coming from nowhere, you know, attracting all the attention from the parents. So, so it was kind of a difficult period for us, but, but uh, ultimately uh, we became good friends and uh, we, uh, uh, things were fine. Now, for myself, uh, the schooling probably was the most difficult part. Uh, the, the English language is not natural. <laughs> Japanese is monosyllable. You know, everything is bisyllable, bisyllable. There's no exception. <laughs> what you see is what you get. <laughs> English language has many, many exceptions. They have singulars and plurals. Uh, don't have that in Japan. Articles, you know, all are they? Why do you need A and B? Well, even to this day when I write something, uh, my wife will tell you that I, I tend to skip all those, <laughs> <laughs> all those necessities. And I ask her, why, why do you need B, United States? Why can't be United States? <laughs> because it doesn't sound right. <laughs> well, that's an explanation, but it still doesn't register in my mind. So, so the language uh, was a difficult part. Uh, food. Uh, 
Now, I really like American food. Okay. Most of it. Uh, but I remember one time I was in grammar school and I was served macaroni and cheese. Okay, and, and being from Japan, whatever is on your plate, you eat it. Okay. However, the, the macaroni and cheese, the cheese flavor, the dairy product, is something really foreign to a Japanese palate. So I had difficulty eating it. And I think I must have gagged about 10 times before I was able to finish the plate. When, I, when we got married, I told my wife, I said, you can serve me anything, but don't give me macaroni and cheese. <laughs> and even to this day, mac cheese is, is a, is a no-no. <laughs> okay, okay. I got a high sign that said I only got two minutes, so let me try. <laughs> Let me try to wrap it up in summary. Um, today uh, marks the 74th anniversary since the A-bomb. Uh, in, in the past 74 years, the United States have stockpiled 1,600 A-bombs or nuclear weapons. China, uh, Russia has similar amounts. China has several hundred. Altogether in the world, there are 5,000. Some of these bombs are several orders of magnitude more powerful than the one that was dropped in Hiroshima. Now, it's hard to comprehend that anyone would drop a bomb or try to use it knowing what has happened in the past. But, however, the geopolitical situation in the world is one of escalation. So I be, I'm beginning to get more and more worried about the future, about the rec uh, recent future. Now, I'm telling this story or sharing this story with you uh, as other Hibakusha have done before me in hopes that our stories combine, well, mitigate proliferation of nuclear weapons and ban A-bombs altogether. But it's my hope that there will, no one will ever have to experience the mushroom cloud or what, what is the uh, thing under the, experience the life under the mushroom cloud. Thank you. Thank you, Howard, for your time, for your stories. And then we'd like to bring up Junji Sarashina to speak. He's the president of the SAS. He's right here.
103 years ago, my father and mom went to Hawaii, and he is a Japanese Buddhist church minister. Those days we had a lot of people from Japan who worked in the sugar plantation and pineapple factory in uh, Hawaii. And uh, my father and the members of the church do the Lahaina Honganji. This is Honganji. This building it used to be the old Honganji in Lahaina. Some of the picture you have seen, a slide you have seen, and what Howard talked about. It's surprised to see one of the shirt was shown on the picture presented by Mr. Takigawa. His name is Arai Sam. He is the second president of our organization a long, long time ago. And uh, everybody knows uh, Dean Matsubayashi, the one was working at and was the leader of the, uh, the the Road Society, which which will help the uh, community of Little uh, Tokyo. Uh, Dean Matsubayashi passed away about two months ago. My dad and Dean's grandfather were in Honolulu together at the Honolulu Buddhist Honganji the day the Pearl Harbor was attacked by the Japanese. His father, my, uh, my father, Dean's grandfather and my father were picked up, picked up by the FBI, falsely accused as a Japanese spy, and they were put into Sand Island concentration camp. And from that day on, they were shipped to United States and Wisconsin, uh, New Mexico, maybe Wyoming, Santa Fe. They were in the relocation camp, or whatever you want to call it, concentration camp. The Japanese ministers were in from Hawaii and also in the United States too, considered as uh, enemy. And I'm sure some of you went to the camps too, concentration camp, relocation camp. Uh, our organization is trying to talk and tell you about the tragedy caused by the that was in Hawaii. I'm sure some of your people recognize the beach scene, beautiful coconut tree. When you're under that mushroom cloud, I didn't see that because you are under. The whole area was covered with dust, smoke, fire. And when you are under, you can't see anything. That particular morning, August 6th, about a little after 8.15, High school student, 16 years old, 
were working at the munition factory in Hiroshima. We were all supporting the government and the uh, Army Navy to create defense items. My case, 16 years old, running a milling machine and creating anti-aircraft explosive, eight inches in diameter, approximately two feet. And that was used to destroy the American airplane. However, the B-29 was flying, flying much, much above that uh, where the bomb could reach and probably some of the B-29 bombers were saying, oh, there's a fireworks underneath us. In the factory, 8-15, August 6th, I was approximately one and a half miles away from the hypercenter. Tremendous orange ray covered the whole town and the whole factory. I was just outside of the factory moving toward the next building. When I reached that particular building, there was a concrete wall next to me, and then the flash knocked me down on my face. I lost conscious for a moment. Everything was falling on my head. Things were just covering me, wood, lumber, dust, oh, glass, and everything. saying, gee, am I alive? I can't see anything. I did not hear the explosion. I felt the force very strong knock me flat on my face. That I know, but boom, the explosion, for some reason, I didn't hear. I said, oh, Gee, that must have been a direct bomb. Because, gosh, my, I can't see, I can't hear, I can't, there's something wrong with me. But, I said, oh, what can I do? I crawl out from the debris. First thing came to my mind was, go to the first aid station. So, somehow I reached the first aid station, and a nurse was standing there. She was covered with thousands of pieces of glass, window glass, blasted her. And she said, <laughs> looked at her, and she's covered with red. And then I said, <clears throat> what can I do for you? She said, <laughs> reached over her mouth, pulled a piece of glass about one inch. And I was scared. Never seen so much blood on a person. Picked up some bandages, and gave some medicine to that nurse, and put some in my pocket, went back to my factory. Factory was leaning, window all broken. Many of my friends, about 150 of my friends, high school students, junior, there were some of them were wounded, some of them were bleeding but nobody died. Our teacher said, no electricity, no power, everybody go home. So, I used to live in the dormitory, so about five of my friends got together, started to go toward the city of Hiroshima. It's covered with smoke and fire and dust so you can't actually see the city itself. <coughs> when 
we reached the first bridge, we tried to cross the bridge and go into the city of Hiroshima. Wrong way traffic. There were people trying to come out of the city to, from the fire, from the smoke. And they're trying to escape, and we are trying to go into the city. The bridge is already covered with wounded, dead in the river. Maybe 500 or so dead, wounded, or oh, some of them are still alive and clinging on to the bank. And we said, there's no way we can go into the city, so we turned back to the factory. Stayed there that night. Then we were able to see the city of Hiroshima burning from this end to that end, 180 degrees. Just the whole thing is covered with smoke and fire. At the time, you can see the flames shooting up 40 yards high. I don't know why, but it's just to create a column of flame. Many of my friends were crying that night because they know their mom, their father, the sister, are living, were in that city, on that, in that fire. Following morning, <clears throat> they gave us a musubi, a rice ball. I said, oh, gee, my, thank you. I haven't had anything to eat for a while. So that was a precious thing. But around 1945, Japan was in a pretty bad condition. Hardly had any food. No sugar, no milk, no bread. Uh, you're lucky if you had a wheat or sweet potato. You know, some of those things were precious things. So getting a free rice ball from people was, man, it's hit the spot. August 7, the following morning, we went into the city of Hiroshima, stepping over dead. Maybe sometimes you even step over them. And we went to the city of Hiroshima. We came to a place called Sumiyoshibashi. I'm sure the uh, Mr. Takigawa and Wadasang is nodding closer to the uh, Taiko Center and went walk toward Takanobashi, which is again approximately one mile away from the Haiko Center. On that street. Two thousand, maybe three thousand, dead, just walking, crawling, all on the road. Some of them are just wandering around and walking around, and you know you can't see their face. There's no face, skin's hanging. No hair, no clothes. And like Cousin Sueshi son said, I've seen uh, a baby burn all black. And for some reason, mother was right there and hanging on to the little baby. That is something you you remember. <clears throat> you never forget those things. <clears throat> that is hell. walking 
and wounded, you try to help them, but there's no way you can help them. There's so many of them are dead and wounded. I am the one walking around and it's the abnormal. The dead is the dead and wounded is the Even though you try to help them, you can't do a, a thing. And uh, I didn't help them either. At that moment, at that time, the survival instinct is within me. And you are only thinking about yourself and you have no way or no means, no method to help the people around you. Only thing you can do is to comfort them. We walk toward our high school, the place where we used to be, which is only about half a mile away. Let's go and see your school. But we couldn't find the school because the whole Hiroshima was just flat. No landmark. Sometimes you see the big building, the concrete building, and say, oh, let's go this way. We found a swimming pool. Our school, swimming pool, stagnated water. We said, oh, yeah, this is our school. Walked over toward that, and it's a lot of high school students, low grade students. Dead, burned, scalping, no school. Can't see the building. Couldn't the swimming pool. So, a couple of low grade students in the water. I asked them, Do you want to get out of the water? Reached over, grabbed his arms, and pulled him out of the swimming pool. The only thing came out of the swimming pool was his skin stuck in my hands. Finally, reached over again, grabbed his belt, and pulled him home. That's all you can do. You can't help him anymore. We started to go toward our dormitory on the way. We stopped at the Red Cross Hospital. Mr. Takigawa knows exactly where. One mile away from the Hypo Center. One mile. The whole hospital was covered with people just wounded, oh, some of them dead. Try to get some medicine, try to get something to use it to help the wounded people. When I walked into the building, the whole hospital was covered with the uh, nurses and the doctors and the wounded people. The doctors needed the treatment. And of course, all the medication, all the bandages, everything was exhausted and used. Can't help them. On the way out, I saw five kids from my own school. I happened to recognize their clothes they were wearing and the tags they had. And the first thing they asked me was, Mizu, Mizu, H2O water. We were told not to give water to anybody who says, uh, Burn, has burned, whole wounded. But when I looked at them, I told myself, they're not going to survive anymore. Why not give them some water? This is the last wishes they had. I walked around, found a dirty tin can. Fortunately, some of the 
broken pipe, had some water running. Got a little bit of water, took it to the kids, give them a little bit to drink, sip at a time. Later on, most of them were not even moving anymore. But I might have killed five kids, but that was their last wishes. told me their names, but I don't remember. Left there and went to the dormitory. Hardly any people were there, maybe five or six of us. And we were attacked by fleas, warm-blooded animal walking around, and they jumped on us. We were scared when you have that many fleas jumping on you. We got some blankets, they went out in the yard, and a friend of mine picked up a pumpkin, and we cracked that pumpkin, and at least we had something to eat. Following day, this the dormitory, the, the teacher from the dormitory said, you and you and you go to help cremate some of the, some of the people. Even though you're 16 years old, and a lot of a kid, he's kind of scared to do the cremation to any people. When we reached that cremation site, a lot of dead people piled up on the lumber and uh, people, uh, the older people said, ah, oh, you young kids, you go out and collect some lumber and woods and so we can use it. All right, that's what we did. How it was saying, we did smell, you know, the cremation, rapid cremation. Yes, I did smell that too. Third day, he just said, you and you and you go to, he says, oh, this is baloney. You can't do that. Not only that, we're so hungry. So we went to Hiroshima Station, which is a northern part. Oh, I just happened to want to say something. Uh, Nakano Hiroko-san, she's a... Uh, our ASA member, Howard is an ASA member, Sui Shisang is an ASA member. Next to her is uh, uh, Gloria Salasan. She's a professor from uh, the university, historian. And uh, Daryl, Daryl, where are you? Oh, Daryl Miho. His many pictures are shown on the, in the museum, his picture. And he is our director. He used to be a, a sports illustration, sports uh, photographer. And then he takes a picture, he travels around the world, Brazil, United States, naturally, Hawaii, Korea, China, and, and Southern, Southern Asia. And he's a young man, even though he's not a day bomb survivor, his dad, his grandfather died in Hiroshima. Uh, well, anyway, what was the thing I'm talking about now? <laughs> uh, oh, uh, before that, I want to say this is Nakano-san. Stand up, Nakano-san. She was a young girl there. And uh, the bomb was dropped. Uh, and her two brothers, young, uh, older brothers, were in the grade school half a mile away, they went to grade school. And when the, drum bo uh, the bomb dropped, the building collapsed. So Nakano-san, the mother, put her on the back and went to the grade school. And when they got to the grade school, how old were your brother? Ten years old. Ten years old and 
Uh, first grade of six years old. Oh, first grade and uh, what grade did you say? Six. Sixth grade. Sixth, sixth grade. Anyway, the building, the collapsed building, school building started to burn. And they can't do anything. We, we can't go into the burning building. But one of the brothers finally escaped from the building and then met mother and Hiroko, but the other brother was in the building, and he burned to death. They watched the whole thing, but the town was burning, was getting too hot for them to stay there, so they had to escape. So I'm sure, you know, Hiroko-san, it's, uh, when it comes to atomic bomb, even though she was a little girl, I'm sure she's uh, have something very touching her heart very deeply. And then what was I telling you now? Hiroshima <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, Hiroshima Eki, thank you, <laughs> 91 years old, you can forgive me now. <laughs> Got to the station and uh, people there, that, you know, from the surrounding city, they all came over there and they gave us food. And, oh, I said, oh, 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 thank you, thank you, arigato, arigato. You know, I ate a lot, because I didn't have anything, hardly any food for a couple of days. And the train is about half a mile away from the station. They couldn't uh, quite reach the city of Hiroshima. We walked down there, and I wanted to go back to my uh, temple, the house which is about 10 miles away from the, from the uh, uh, city of Hiroshima. On the train, many dead, many wounded, were all in there. I'm one of the few, the normal one. I finally got to my house and looked at the home temple and said, oh, I'm home now. <laughs> now, one more minute. <laughs> <laughs> That's the important part. <laughs> and then mom hugged me, and my sister cared for me. I must have been a stinking something. <laughs> my brother, oh, I forgot to tell you, the, uh, Hiroshima, the second day after the fire, many people from the city said, oh, my, my daughter is not home. My loved one didn't come home. So they went back to the city. And the following day, they went to find them. They didn't know anything about radiation. can see, can smell, you know. After 20 or 30 days, they try to comb their hair. It's not in their comb, uh, it's not in their head anymore. It's in the comb. Many people suffered. So many people died after, after the atomic bomb. Not directly affected by that, but the radiation. I was fortunate to get home. Some of these uh, effects, well, self-explanatory. The bomb is, Hiroshima was 17 kiloton, 17 kiloton, 16 to 17 kiloton. The modern bomb they have today is one megaton. So strong, and not only one warhead, ten of them are on the ICBM on the missile. One in San Diego, one in Los Angeles, one in oh, in the Hollywood area. It's going to cover. We're gonna suffer. We're the one gonna suffer. As a Hibakusha, 
I'm going to tell you, so many people will suffer, your kids will suffer, your grand grandkids will suffer too. And we must tell the government or tell the people in the world, not only Trump, but <laughs> but, uh, but the foreign country, North Korea, China, Russia. Who's going to be the winner when all of us are wiped out and your kids are wiped out? Who's going to be the winner? We are going to be the loser no matter what because it's going to destroy us, the human being. We are going to see that we have to have a world of peace, like Kazu Suishi said, and we have to turn the world around. Nuclear weapon will not resolve the problem. The human being will suffer. Thank you very much for... <laughs>
that believe that dropping the bomb ended the war and saved lives ultimately. Can I start? Okay. Now, it's been said that uh, the rationale for dropping the uh, United States dropping the bomb on Japan was to save American life or allied lives. Okay. Uh, maybe even to the point of a million people. However, at that time, 1945, in August 1945, Japan had run out of resources uh, in terms of war power. Uh, they didn't have enough. They couldn't, they didn't have any airframe to fight against the B-29 coming over. Uh, the food was gone, the gasoline, oil, fuel, they had all disappeared. And Japan was already in a state of negotiation uh, with, uh, with uh, countries like Russia and even with the United States for a possible surrender. Although there were military factions in Japan that wanted want to pursue her until death. Okay. Now, on the United States side, uh, should we have dropped the bomb? The, you know, there are 70 scientists that worked on the A-bomb, told Truman to sign a petition saying don't drop the bomb. Truman asked eight five-star generals whether he should use the bomb or not. And seven out of the eight said, no, don't do it. Uh, now, for me, I, I th I'm thinking, why couldn't, if the uh, United States had to drop the bomb, why couldn't it have been dropped on a remote island to show the power and the potential destruction it could cause? Why would you kill what is it, altogether 400,000 people just to prove a point when it was imminent that Japan was going to surrender? I, I think Paul would say enough. You know, that covers just about the same, same way. At the same time, many times uh, people would say, why did they attack Pearl Harbor? Remember Pearl Harbor. So, whichever you stand or wherever you stand, there was always different opinion. And then sometime in this world, you might have to respect the opinion of both sides. Thank you. Um, I didn't see, uh, there's, we'll have one more question up there. Joy? Oh, okay, two more. <laughs> Hi, Junji, I know you. Um, you know, it's amazing what you just said because, uh, because when I was in camp, I was in Amachi uh, concentration camp during the war. When the bomb fell and I found out what it was, I thought the same thing. I was 16 years old, same as Junji, and I thought, why couldn't they have dropped it on a, on a, a deserted island? That's what I thought in 1945. And I just couldn't understand dropping it on a population and decimating all those people. It was just wrong. It was wrong then, it was wrong now. Here, here. <laughs> what is uh, very difficult for me to understand is why did they throw a second bomb after they saw all this suffering in Hiroshima just three days later. Can you tell me something about that? Uh, I have the same feeling. Well, I was I had the same feeling about the first bomb, <laughs> but you know, it's only three three days later. Why drop it? Uh, I know that there there was a faction, a uh, military faction in Japan, that uh, prolonged the you know the, the surrender, um, and it was only uh, through Hirohito, uh, Emperor Hirohito. 
after the second bomb was shot, uh, basically he told uh, the cabinet that Japan must bear the unbearable and we must surrender and stop this carnage. I mean, I'm only paraphrasing, okay? But he said something to the effect, and it was through his effort and his feeling that uh, Japan did indeed surrender. But I agree with you. Uh, I, they shouldn't have dropped the first one, but having seen the destruction of capability of the first bomb, why drop the second one? It just does not make sense. We have a historian here, Gloria. Uh, she is a historian. Do you have any? I have an answer. Yes. Yeah, do you have an answer? Yeah. I think she, uh, good to hear from the professor. Uh, the, the, the Manhattan Project costed the equivalent of $3 billion at the time. And they had the bomb and they had to use it because they knew that at the end of the war there would be congressional hearings and they would ask for where did the money go. So that was the rationale for dropping the second bomb. That's the rationale for dropping it, but it's not a justification for dropping it. Okay. So many, so much information. I mean, I think it's clear, and I think this is something that happens when we were putting this exhibition together. We, we, we ask so many questions, and, we, and we, we're looking for answers, but in looking for those answers, we only get more questions, because it's, again, it's such a, it's such a terrible thing that had happened to a, a, a nation, um, and it's the only time it's ever happened. So it's, it's just again, I, I want to thank all of you for coming. I want to thank our guests, um, Director Takigo from the uh, Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum. <laughs> our, two, our two survivors, Howard Kakita and Junji Sarashina. <laughs> and like um, um, Kazue Sueishi, who's no longer with us, but her memory is still with us. Um, thank you to all of you for all that you have given to share this message with everybody. We appreciate it, and we, we hope that we can become um, people who can then share the story with others as well. So thank you. So with that, the, the exhibition is still open. I will, I will go over there and I'll make sure they don't kick you out. <laughs> I, will, I will stay there and keep it open as long as, well, not too long, but a little bit longer so that you guys can see what you get. But we also invite you always to come back and visit the museum. Um, I think it's an interesting juxtaposition of the Japanese-American story along with this unique story of the Jap Jap Japanese experience in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So again, thank you all for coming.